4. So going back, we'll review this. If 1 Corinthians 14, 13 to 17. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you are saying? And apparently neither do you, Paul is saying. Notice that the context is praying in tongues, a heretofore unknown foreign language, within the local church congregation, so that others can hear it, especially those who know that foreign language and would understand the message in that language, and thereby all will be edified and not privately oneself be edified. Besides, tongues is, this, according to 14, as we will see in the future in chapter 14, tongues is assigned to unbelieving Jews of temp impending temporal judgment if they don't repent. Well, you have to have unbelieving Jews in the congregation. And the message is something of that order. You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified, and neither are you if you are not cognitive of what you are saying. And at the beginning of chapter 14, Paul specifically indicates this, that if one speaks mysteries, i.e. incomprehensible sounds to God instead of comprehensible things to man, for whom the gift is intended as per Paul's instructions, then how can one exercise the gift of tongues properly which is meant to be discernible to the human mind, the desired effect of the gift when it is properly ex expressed, when cannot be properly edified or informed, which must include cognitive understanding, if the one who does the speaking does not understand himself nor the others understand who hear him. Objections to this teaching of Paul force their own interpretation on the following verses. In order to claim that the gift of tongues has a purpose of the speaking of mysteries to God, but this would directly contradict the context of the entire section on tongues, especially in 14, to do it in an orderly and cognitive fashion for the edification of men. It would seem, it would especially violate what Paul says later in verses 13 to 17, which we have already examined. This obvious interpretation which follows is therefore ignored, as are 13 to 17 by prayer language and tongues advocates alike. <coughs> First thing, 1 Corinthians 14, 33-4, For anyone who is speaking in a tongue in your congregation or by yourself is not speaking to men like he is supposed to, but instead to God. For anyone in, this, in the way you are properly doing it now, as verses 13-17 to 17 indicates, that it should be done with cognitive understanding. They reverse it and say, this is where you should do it. So nobody understands. What? Who is speaking in a tongue is not speaking to men like you should be doing, but to God. Who is not, you don't need to speak to God. God understands everything. He's omnipotent. Who is not the designated audience? 1 Corinthians 14, 21 and 22. Unbelieving Jews back in time during the early church age are who make up a large part of those who are being preached in tongues. Those unbelieving Jews who refuse to repent and believe in Christ and believe in God. They're going to hear the understanding. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. No, Paul is admonishing the Christians, Corinthians, Christians, here for misusing the gift of tongues, causing no one to understand what is being said due to ecstatic, nonsensical uttering and or lack of interpretation. He's not explaining that this is the proper use of tongues to utter mysteries to God, but that it is improper. Fourth, since tongues are categorized as spiritual gifts, and since all spiritual gifts are to edify the body of believers, then tongues are not to be privately expressed to edify only oneself. Spiritual gifts are, are given to edify the body of believers for the common good. Now to each one of the manifestation, manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. See, Explanations that the gifts did cease and then were revived in latter days are inadequate. Many Pentecostals hold that the sign gifts did cease and that they recurred in these latter days. This may be demonstrated from Scripture, however. There is no biblical evidence that there will be a reoccurrence of the, in the church of the sign gifts, or that believers will work miracles near the end of the church age. However, there is ample evidence that neither the end of the age there will be false prophets, 
the near, the end of the age, there will be false prophets who perform miracles, prophecy, and cast out demons in Jesus' name. During the church age, there will be false leaders who fashion themselves as ministers of righteousness. <clears throat> During the tribulation period, there is no indication that believers, other than the two witnesses of Revelation 11, 3 to 12, will perform miracles. Those performed by the two witnesses are exceptional, and their actions are, in, are comparable to those of the Hebrew Bible prophet of Moses' time, of ancient Israel, rather than to those of the apostles. The two witnesses are not part of the church, and if they were, they could hardly be considered typical of the church. The latter rain arguments are incorrectly based on verses that actually are referring to a seasonal rainfall in Israel. Hosea 6.3 and Joel 2.23, for example, refer not to some unusual outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days of the church age. They refer instead to spring rains, in contrast to early rains in the fall when they would occur. The arguments based on the expression in the last days in Acts 2, 16 and 21 are also invalid. In the last days, <clears throat> if the last days referred to in Acts 2, 17 includes the, la the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the church age, and if this is that, includes Pentecost, then it cannot mean at the same time the last days of the church, this church age. On the other hand, if the last days do not include Pentecost, and Pentecost was not a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, and Acts 2, 16 to 21 refers specifically to Israel and its still future. Furthermore, the historical setting of Joel 2, 28 is after the second coming. You just have to read the whole chapter. Come on. Further, verse 2, 28 indicates afterward, after the day of the Lord, his second coming is indicated in verses 30 to 32, so that the restoration of the gifts will be revived after the church age. So they have to cease in order for them to be revived. If it's ongoing today, come on. Christ is going to come fairly soon. In the rapture first, then seven years later, second coming. Either way, this passage gives no evidence for a reoccurrence of miraculous gifts during this latter days, last latter days of the church. The present charismatic movement is characterized by phenomena that began in the church about 100 years ago, which, apart from any historical connection or evidence, are claimed to be the same as the miracles performed in the apostolic age, the first part of the church age, when the apostles were active. It is simply naive to accept this claim without some direct historical link or solid biblical evidence that these present phenomena are the same as those in the days of the apostles. The most reliable evidence would be a direct historical link to the apostolic gifts due to their continuity in the church. However, as already argued, history testifies to the contrary. The gifts ceased, and there is no reason to expect their presence or reoccurrence today. Lack of similarity with the church age doctrines of the faith falsifies this imaginary revival of the gifts. Introduction. <coughs> Edgar continued. For any phenomena to make credible claim to be the same as the gifts and miracles of the apostolic age, there must be a great similarity between the two. Any phenomena can be intentionally duplicated or copied. Therefore, similarity alone cannot prove the modern phenomena are genuine. And they still, and they say this imaginary language is incomprehensible, blah, 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 you're not a believer, all kinds of things. But scripture demands that they it be it paid attention to in every detail. Conversely, a lack of similarity is definitely evidence against the claim that they are the same as the church age gifts and miracles. Miracles and signs were clearly and overtly miraculous, but not duplicated as such today. Edgar goes on to say, and imagine an examination of the church age scriptures indicates that the modern charismatic phenomena are not sufficiently similar to those of the apostolic age of the church age. Where are the tongues of fire and the rushing of a mighty wind? As on the day of Pentecost. Do missionaries blind their opponents as Paul did? Do church leaders discern hypocrisy and pronounce the immediate death of members as in Acts 5, 1 to 11? Ananias and Sapphira. Do evangelists amaze an entire city with miracles as did Philip? Are they then taken to another place of ministry by the Holy Spirit? Are entire multitudes healed by merely being in the shadow of the healer? 
do prophets give specific prophecies which come to pass soon after? Are people raised from the dead, organic diseases and crippled limbs immediately healed without notice or faith required? I often said that when I went to that charismatic church. I said, listen, let's point out the guy that's got this gift of healing. We'll get him right on down to the, the, uh, the hospital and just ask him to uh, bring him to the morgue. You know? What's the deal? Go to start visiting people in the hospital before they get their operation. The miracles and signs of the apostolic age were clearly and overtly miraculously miraculous. Even the opponents of the Gospels could not refute the miracles of the apost apostolic age. They even accused Jesus of performing doing supernatural things, but they claimed he did it to be Isabel. So they, they're testifying that Jesus did perform miracles. Where is that today? But today's sign, signs and wonders cannot be verified even by those who are neutral or friendly to the movement. Every time I heard it, it was somebody over there in the Andes Mountains or something. A detailed comparison with specific individual gifts shows an amazing lack of similarity between the gifts of the early days of the church age and the modern days, 19 to 21st centuries and thereafter, charismatic gifts. The so-called revived gift of tongues today is not the same as portrayed in Scripture. Edgar goes on, the tongues of the apostolic age were genuine miracles since they were the ability to speak previously unlearned foreign languages rather than the charismatic tongues of today which can be easily duplicated in the sense of counterfeit copies, and not only that, their grammatical structure is rather simplistic. The only passage describing the nature of tongues speaking in Acts 2 is Acts 2, 4-11. With their definitely languages, it is stipulated, Paul stated that the tongues speaking in Cornelius' house was the same as on the day of Pentecost, and there is no reason to assume the instance of Acts 19.6 was different. Since 1 Corinthians 14 repeatedly states that the tongue speaking in Corinth was in an assembly of believers, why then was it mysterious and why was there a lack of understanding? It was because the believers did not understand the foreign languages of the tongue speakers? The mystery was not because the tongues in 1 Corinthians differed in nature from the tongues in Acts. Let's just take a look. Here it is, Acts 2. And there appeared to them tongues as fire, as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Not incomprehensible. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all of these are who are speaking Gal Galileans? They don't know these our language from where we came. And how is it that each we hear each of them in our own language to which we were born? Hello, native language, Parthian, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. There you go. Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in their own tongues. How can you miss that? Over and over and over again. It's a native tongue from foreign people, and you wouldn't know their foreign language. How they miss that? It must be deliberate. So, early church age tongues were verifiable foreign languages, as I just read. The term glossa means language and is never used for ecstatic speech. By contrast, today's tongues have never been verified as actual languages. All objective studies by impartial linguists indicate that they do not have the characteristics common to language. They're just baby talk. How much I do that all the time. I say that kind of stuff because uh, I live in a violent town and a lot of people try to confront me with some kind of stuff 
So I have to tell you, I don't know what they're